welcome to today's episode of Deep Transformation, Self Society Spirit. I'm Roger Walsh, and our co host is the uh, distinguished John Dupuy. And our guest today is the truly remarkable Chris Bache, who is a internationally known uh, professor of philosophy and religious studies, an author, an award winning teacher, and an internationally known speaker. Uh, usually in these dialogues, uh, John Knight tries to stay in the background, but the topic of today is so remarkable, the experience is described so literally out of this world, that I want to just give a, take a moment to give a context for the discussion. Compared to the world's many cultures, Western culture is unusual in a variety of ways. In fact, researchers have recently described us as weird. W-I-E-R-D, Western, industrialized, educated, rich, and democratic. And so much research has been done on Westerners that it was assumed that our characteristics were pretty much common to the world's cultures. But now we're beginning to see that, that that's not true and that other cultures have their own richnesses and gifts of a wide variety. One very important distinction between traditional Western culture and most of the world's cultures is in their attitude and use of altered states of consciousness. The anthropologist Erika Bouginon uh, discovered in her world, world survey that over 90% of the world's cultures have institutionalized altered states of consciousness, meaning that they use a variety of practices to induce specific states of consciousness, and then mine them for the information and wisdom. They use and look at they and venerate uh, states such as dreams, uh, hypnosis, a trance of various kind, uh, and states induced by meditation, contemplation, yoga, uh, asceticism, a wide variety. And these cultures anthropologists now call Poly, uh, polyphasic, meaning that they draw their understanding of reality from many phases of consciousness. By contrast, Western culture is pretty unique in having been until very recently a monophasic culture in that we draw our understanding of ourselves and the world almost entirely from the usual waking state and kind of look down on other states as inferior or deluded or distorted in various ways. But that's begun to change and it began to change in the 60s, of course, with the introduction of psychedelics to the culture, which was soon followed by an influx of Asian practices, meditation, yoga, <coughs> contemplations. And after that, by the rediscovery and rebirth of Western contemplative practices. So that now, we have in the West a wide variety of practices for inducing altered states. And the West is undergoing a dramatic and very important but often unrecognized transformation from a monophasic culture to a polyphasic culture. One in which we are now beginning to appreciate and research and draw our understanding of ourselves and reality from multiple states of consciousness. One of the most potent and remarkable ways of inducing older states is with psychedelics. That's what started our own Western culture's transformation. And it's now the subject of a lot of uh, solid research at places like uh, one of the leaders is John Hopkins University, where scientists and, re and clinical clinicians are discovering that psychedelics have, just as the original research in the 60s and 70s found, a wide variety of therapeutic applications. And, uh, and perhaps uh, most surprising, very profound spiritual applications. The capacity for inducing profound openings to radically altered states in which which profound vistas and understandings of ourselves and realities become available. That, of course, is not new to the rest of the world, but is, is new to Western research. And the findings are quite remarkable. 
So we are very fortunate in having with us a man who has devoted his life to the research of these curious chemicals and has done it both through academic research and comparative cultural analysis, but also through a remarkably intense, long lasting, carefully analyzed and documented systematic exploration of the use of these chemicals themselves. His experiences are nothing less than extraordinary and have far, far reaching implications for our understanding of the fundamental nature of reality in ourselves. He did this in a, as a systematic investigation into the fundamental nature of reality. And he was able to reflect on his firsthand observations with the eye of a trained researcher, philosopher, theologian. And then he pulled together cross-cultural, historical, and religious evidence to bring to bear on his own investigations. That's so these are some of the remarkable things our guest Chris Bache has explored. I mentioned that he was a prolific author and his books include Dark Night, Early Dawn, subtitle Steps to a Deep Ecology of Mind. He's also taught about and written about education and is an award-winning educator himself and his book is titled The Living Classroom. And most recently he wrote the literally mind-boggling book, LSD in the Mind of the Universe, in which he detailed his exploration of psychedelics and the insights they opened for him. So that's a long introduction, but it felt Im important to give a context for these very remarkable experiences that Chris will be gifting us with in sharing his, his insights over the many years of deep systematic exploration. I've just spent the weekend going back to the book. I read it uh, a, a couple of years ago in manuscript form and was impressed enough to write mm -hmm. a, a review for it. And I've been spending the weekend with it. And once again, I feel like I've had my worldview expanded multiple times and my understanding of myself and reality challenged multiple times, all in very valuable ways. So Chris, that's a long introduction, but it's truly a, a delight and an honor to be with you today. And uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Roger. It's a very warm introduction and I'm just delighted to be here with you and John today. It's a pleasure. Well, there are many places we can we can go with this, and hopefully yeah. we will. But uh, Roger, allow, allow me to to give my little two cents. Please, uh, yes. Last <laughs> week, Roger asked me, "Would you like to have Christopher Page on?" I was like, "Seriously, <laughs> yes." And uh, I had one week or less than a week, so immediately I ordered the book, and uh, I, I got the audio version. Thank God, and that's what that's kept me through the weekend. But I just want to put out there your book. Dark Night, Early Dawn was one of the more important books uh, for me personally that I ever read. So mm -hmm. when your name came up again, the possibility to have this conversation, now I'll, I'll tell you what I, my, I can't remember all the specifics, but after 20 years, it's been a while, uh, when I first read it, I had a stabilized understanding of non-duality based on my explorations and journeys and vision questing and, and fasting and prayers and meditation and all that. And I, I, I kind of got it, but the way you expressed it, something in that book just consolated it. And it has been accessible to me in a stable uh, form ever since then. So that's, that's a tremendous gift. So this, uh, this book that I have been listening to is unlike, uh, anything that I've experienced and it is either you're absolutely sane or you're completely insane. <laughs> and my, uh, my experience is along these lines um, says this really stinks of deep truth. Mm -hmm. And um, also the, the very human, the very humble way that you present and self revelatory what's going on in your personal life and how you did it and everything is, is, uh, 
uh, somebody with an open mind, I think, is is just ends up trusting you. Uh, just I'm in the hands of somebody I can listen to. And then from there, it goes on to. Uh, it's very big. This may be a, a bringing together of everything we've been working on in our generation, but in a new holistic, religious, scientific, everything vision that um, that transforms us from a reality where a lot of us are killing ourselves or live in deep depression to an absolutely a thousand percent changed view of reality. And I'm not using that as hyperbole, at least I'm not trying to. Mm -hmm. It's that big, it's that radical. Uh, it's that, um, that pay attention to this. Thank you. Your description, John, touches me very deeply. And it really touches me that something I've written has influenced your experience of non-duality. That just really touches me. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Chris, you know, I, of course, I, I think everyone will want to know what motivated you to begin this extraordinary quest. And maybe you can just say, say a little bit about what sure. the nature of what you actually did yeah. uh, to induce these remarkable experiences. And, and what motivated you to begin? Well, all my life, I've had a, just a deep passion to understand our universe. I mean, I was in the seminary starting in high school, training to be a Catholic priest, left that, went on to get a degree in theology from Notre Dame and then Cambridge and Brown. I finished Brown in philosophy of religion, uh, but a, an absolute convinced agnostic with strong atheistic inclinations. But the passion to understand what's real, why is there so much suffering in the world? Is there an intelligence in existence uh, was still there, still pushing me in all of my studies. Now, I had finished my dissertation. I was looking for where to go next, and I encountered Stan Groff's book, Realms of the Human Unconscious, that extraordinary book that just turned my life around. And one reading, he convinced me that LSD or psychedelics could be used safely if you use them in a pro with proper precautions to explore the deep structure of one's consciousness. And some of his anecdotes also indicated more than one's own personal unconscious, that one could reach out deeper to explore deeper fabric of consciousness. And I quickly realized the, the philosophical significance, not just psychological significance of his work. So I realized that people in my profession, philosophy of religion, my discipline, would soon, the ones making the most important contribution to the field would be people writing out of an experiential basis, not just an intellectual basis. To do that, you have to have not just a few experiences, but you have to undergo systematic training in the discipline. So that's what I did. It was 1979 when I began what became a 20-year journey. I worked for four years. I stopped for six years for reasons that I give in the book. And then I resumed for 10 years. But overall, over 20 years, I did 73 high-dose LSD sessions following Stan's protocol. And this is a, a regimen that I wouldn't recommend. I really don't recommend today. With hindsight, I realized that I really pushed myself harder than was sometimes wise. Uh, but I used a lot of precautions. I took, did all of the classic training for uh, and precautions for doing fully internalized sessions with a sitter. My sitter was a clinical psychologist whom I was married to at the time, Carol, and uh, using very carefully selected evocative music. Basically, and, and let me mention, I, I worked with high doses of LSD initially because I was still thinking in terms of a model of individual awakening or individual healing. And I, I was thinking, I knew that karma, according to the Eastern models, it was finite karma. And basically, I wanted to accelerate my own spiritual development. And I thought that if I could uh, sustain the intensity of the confrontation, I could basically 
bite off bigger bites of karma in each session if I work with high doses rather than melt it more slowly with low doses. And it was simply a matter of efficiency. I did, it was hard to hit time for these sessions in a dual career marriage. And I just thought I would work a little harder, more aggressively. And that turned out that was a, based on a completely false set of assumptions. Uh, I found that in my work, within a few years, I was entering into domains that were far, far beyond anything that made sense in terms of an individual model of transformation. I began to understand that my sessions had been had catalyzed something that was aimed at nothing less than some type of healing or transformation of the human species as a whole. So working with very, very high doses, since, since existence is unified from the very start, working with high doses that hyper amplifies consciousness activates, it only, it, it changes not only how deep you go, but it changes how wide you are when you go there. So it activates a larger field of consciousness, which then triggers the, the cycles of death and rebirth that workings with psychedelics therapeutically does. So I did this for 20 years and I finished in 1999. And then I digested those experiences for another 20 years. This, this is a very challenging undertaking. It took a long time to connect all the dots and to absorb them. And uh, it took me five years to write the book. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's a and, lot. Yeah. It's a Actually, lot. I was thinking I would be much more comfortable writing this book posthumously, holding it and releasing it posthumously because it is so exposing in the sense of your most intimate relationship with the divine. Uh, but the mother told me, no, there's no time for that kind of indulgence. Uh, the word it was needed and it would mesh, it would support other people in their work and our times that we were going into historically, we all hands on deck, it, you know, all hands on deck needed to come forward now. Uh, beautiful. And, and it really does feel that this work you did and really was work uh, of exploration with these psychedelics and the writing of the book really is was done out of a very large motive and and as you said it was it was work i i was mm -hmm. struck by just the you know our culture has this very naive media view of psychedelics as being done for you know getting high and having a good time and yes that can happen but and you had some extraordinarily ecstatic experiences but you also went through the hell realms not once but multiple times and as you described yeah. having to open to levels of not only your own suffering but collective suffering the history of human cruelty etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean this was extraordinary i i just found myself bowing uh, to the courage you had to bring to this time after time after time. And yet you always seem to find that ultimately there was a value in, in the suffering. Yeah. I wonder if you could say what kept you going and what kind of value you found there. Well, this was the great gift that Stan gave me in his work. He taught me to trust the process. Uh, and that was affirmed in my own experience. And my experience was if you completely trust the process and let your session take you where it wants to take you, uh, you it, it may get worse and worse. You may enter experiences that are completely inscrutable, that completely horrifying. You don't understand why you're going here or what sense it makes. But if you surrender to it completely, this will come to eventually to a culmination and you'll be taken through a death rebirth cycle. You, some part of you will die, will slough off. You'll be taken into a transition. And through this transition, you will awaken in a different reality into a different level of reality. 
And for the remainder of that session, you will experience teaching or experiences within a completely ecstatic framework. So there is the purification side of a session and the ecstatic side of a session. So what you internalize at the end of the day is not just the suffering, but the entire cycle that suffering reaches a peak, there is a culmination, there is a breakthrough, and then there is joy and ecstasy and, and communion, and then integration at the end. It's the balance of the joy and the ecstasy of insight with the purification process that makes it manageable. If I had to go through all the suffering for years without that ecstatic teaching, I would not have been able to do it. As it was, it, it, it was difficult. When I was going through the ocean of suffering, which was in the third and fourth years of the work, fifth, fifth year of the work, the morning of a session was difficult because I had a sense of what I was getting into and where it was going. I'd, but I don't think it's any more difficult than a soldier on the eve of a battle or a mother on the eve of labor, you know, if it's, especially if it's your second or third birth, you know what you're getting into, you know it's going to be a hard day, you gird your loins and you prepare for it. And in, for my case, <clears throat> I don't think what I did was any more exotic than someone who wants to climb Mount Everest or someone who wants to go to the North Pole. Personally, I don't know why anybody in their right mind would want to climb Mount Everest, you know, but, <laughs> but I do understand the explorer's mentality. I wanted to see, I wanted to understand, I, I wanted to know. And no matter how deep I went, I found that there was always more that I could be shown that, that would be shown me. It was that did, you hunger. Feel, did you feel you were being held or guided in, 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 some, in some sense, taken care of in this Absolutely. journey? Absolutely. And every step along the way, when I would go through, this consciousness was waiting for me. And I might not understand the logic of the sequence of the pairing of things for years. In fact, there are certain things that I only began to understand when I wrote the book. But as I went through, I had a basic structure enough to know that there was a logic to this process. And I always felt met. I felt met and engaged, sometimes very consciously where I would ask questions and it would orchestrate my experience. But always um, there was an intelligence meeting me, taking me, uh, educating me, uh, breaking me down, beating me down to dust. Uh, taking me further, taking me back over and over again until I understood something. And then it would take me deeper. And there was a systematic progression to this process. I found that this systematic progression was really important because there's so many levels of consciousness that it can take you into. But when you enter a new level of consciousness, it's very disorienting. I mean, it, it just cognitively is confusing. You, you, and this manifests by not being able to remember everything that happened to you. you. You just don't have a framework in your mind to hold it. But if you go back to it again and again and again, and you're systematic and rigorous and you record carefully, your system will acclimate and you will learn how to stay conscious in dimensions of reality that previously had swallowed you. And I actually began in time to realize that this deeper consciousness was titrating the experiences of transcendence, giving me time to absorb and acclimate, even though sometimes I wanted to run on, it kept me and fed me in small steps so that I could retain and hold what it had been giving me. Because the purpose I found was not simply to transcend and experience some form of ecstasy. The purpose was to bring that ecstasy back into your time-space consciousness and first hold on to it, remember it. And then secondly, digest it and let it seep into your bones as deeply as possible. And, and you, you, you talked about in the book is how you framed or you became to understand that the hell realms, suffering realms that you would have to, to visit were 
uh, for your benefit and they were for purification, that they were getting you prepared for the revelation. Yeah, there it's complicated. I mean, it took me about two and a half years to go through what Stan Groff calls the perinatal dimension of consciousness, the perinatal level where the, the purifications are very intense and the physical purifications and emotional purifications, which eventually end in, for me, ended in ego death, you know, like just being shattered, my entire physical identity being turned inside out. And then the ocean of suffering began. And in the beginning, I thought this was a deeper form of personal suffering. It was a deeper form of ego death. But eventually, and this is why I wrote Dark Night Early Dawn at core to answer this question, to solve the riddle. Why did the suffering get as large as it did? And the conclusion I came to is that it really wasn't aimed at my personal transformation at all. It was aimed at healing the human species, that the human psyche in an aggregate form at the collective unconscious, there are wounds which humanity has still not healed. The things that we've done to each other in war, the terrible disasters, that all the suffering that human beings have accumulated, not all of it has been um, healed. And that there are vast tracts of the collective psyche where this suffering still festers. And I, I think every spiritual tradition recognizes that in deep spiritual practice, you have an opportunity, you don't have to do it, but it, an invitation is sometimes extended that if you are willing to take on some of that suffering, literally just to become aware of it, it can move through you and resolve itself, just like our personal suffering enters into our awareness, moves through us and resolves itself. And so for two years, uh, I did the ocean of suffering work. Um, and it wasn't really until about halfway through that, that I began to understand that this wasn't for me. It was for my family. It was for the human family. And only later did I begin to understand the historical circumstances of our times that made the healing of the human family, the healing of our past so important in order to clear the foundation, so to speak, to allow an imminent transformation to take place in history. And, and I'm sure that gave you, you mentioned girding your loins up that gave you that warrior or soldierly perspective it's not just about you chris you know to to do this thing uh, that was way beyond way beyond any human capacity to survive i would believe just just on its own but to keep coming back and uh not and and it shifts from from being an individual quest to uh, mm -hmm everybody and everything. And it may be the case that this, well, it's largely a function of my choice to work with these very, very high doses that blow you so deeply into the deep structure of, of reality. But I think one of the things I learned, it, it may, this may not open for everybody. Everybody may not enter these domains. One of the things I learned over the course of my journey is that this was a task which my soul took on before I was born. So this was part of my karmic choice uh, to do this work. So it wasn't forced upon me and it wasn't a tragedy. Uh, it was simply part of my life's work. And the universe more than rewarded me for this phase of the work because following the ocean of suffering, it took me places in the ocean of suffering and afterwards, it more than amply paid me or re repaid me for uh, taking this work on. As always happens, whenever you do anything for others, the universe has no choice but to get, give back to you. That's because the universe acts out of oneness. So if we do something for others, it always comes back to you in one form or another. 
beautiful. And, and, it, and it sounds as though this shift you went through from the as assumption with which you entered this work that you were doing it for your own understanding, revelation, transformation, and yet you were forced almost against your <laughs> inclinations to, to see this in a larger context that you were in some way, some mysterious way, both opening to and allowing yourself to be an instrument for the transformation of collective consciousness. And I, mm -hmm. I can certainly understand that was challenging because it's a very different, it's a different worldview. It, it's a very different set of assumptions about the nature of ourselves and reality that yeah. even makes that recognition possible. And I, I can certainly understand what a shift that was. Would you like to say more about that? <clears throat> My first concern was that at first it sounded like ego gone amok. I mean, it sounded like ego inflation. And so I really had to sit with that for a long time because my experiences were telling me that was not what was happening. But the larger challenge is, as you said, Roger, this is a very different worldview. In the classic individual patient model, you, the individual is having experiences. So you, the individual has transpersonal experiences and the individual is always kind of at the center of the circle. But in this model, my individual existence was completely secondary to this dynamic. And so it becomes not a matter of my being being central to what's happening, I got the system, I got something started, but I dissolve completely into pre-existing fields of consciousness. And these fields of consciousness are what are the dynamic force having these experiences. So it manifests not only in the ocean of suffering, but it manifests later when I was going into archetypal reality and causal oneness reality. Um, it's hard to describe, but in many ways, in many experiences, I was like, Chris Bache was like a bit player. Uh, <laughs> not that it's like there is something going on. This is so challenging that the, in the book, I have an appendix, which in the appendix is what dies and is reborn. When you experience so many deaths and rebirths, it becomes a, a cognitive question. What is it that's actually dying? It feels personal and it, it, you experience it. Is it just ego dying over and over again? And the answers that I offer at that, in that part, I, I know push very, very far. I mean, because on the one hand it's ego and then it becomes species ego. And then it becomes something I call the shamanic persona. But in the end, what is dying, I think is literally some aspect of cosmic consciousness or some dimension of cosmic reality is softening and surrendering and opening up to a still deeper dimension of cosmic consciousness. And this deeper dimension of cosmic consciousness pours its blessings into me at the very bottom, but it's not primarily into me. It, it pours it into the deeper dimension of cosmic consciousness itself. And I know those are very hard concepts to entertain. And it's a, it's a very different way of thinking and it's tentative, my description, but something along that order, I think is required to understand when you explode consciousness this radically. And again, I don't think it's wise for people to, to explode consciousness this radically. I would work with lower doses. I'd work with psilocybin, uh, gentler substances if I were doing it over again. Here we have to appreciate that LSD in this quantity, when it's contained, when it's intensified in a therapeutic modality, you basically just shatter your consciousness and dissolve it far beyond physical limits. And you spend hours dissolved into some stratum 
of the universe and then you congeal and consolidate it and then you shatter leaving your historical existence radically behind and dissolve into into some fabric some stratosphere of consciousness and you live there for a while it lives you are it part of it as it lives and then you congeal and bring it back and hold it yeah. beautiful uh, I, i'd love i'd love to tease out several things you said but but mm -hmm. I, I do want to ask a very specific question that is you've referred on several occasions to the very high doses of lsd used so mm -hmm. might you just tell us what doses you did use yeah i aim to be working at 600 micrograms but because i wasn't using a pharmaceutical uh, identified um, dose i would say 500 to 600 micrograms to be safe um but it was not less than five. That is a lot of LSD, yes, yeah. <laughs> put mildly. Yeah. Uh, and I want to, I want to uh, tease, tease out your description of this very remarkable phenomenon of the, of the death rebirth experience, which is found as a, as a, and recognized as a very important experience and a literal birth experience, psych spiritual birth experience across the world, spiritual traditions. It's deliberately sought in traditions such as shamanism. Mm. And yet you describe it in not an entirely new way, but a, a, a radically expanded way as a repetitive process of dying to one identity uh, and limitation after another, after another, after another, reconstituting a new, uh, new, more porous, expanded identity, and then having to offer that into, into the whole. And let me just see, check my understanding of death rebirth against yours and have you, have you respond from your enlarged perspective. To me, it seems that what actually dies, what we confuse ourselves to be and what actually dies in the death rebirth experience is our self-representation. We mistake a self-image or a self-concept or a, a self-narrative for our true self. And what needs to die is that representation. So it dies, we find ourselves opened to a much larger perspective and possibility, both of both of our own identity and of the nature of reality. But for some reason, I, I tended to think until hearing you just now, uh, I tended to think of for psychological reasons, psychodynamic habitual patterns reestablish themselves and uh, another self-representation forms. But you're putting this in a larger, more cosmic, uh, or ontological perspective suggesting that an even deeper understanding of the, of the death rebirth would be that one that as part of the cosmic play, the Leela, the, the, the formation of the universe by the two cosmic beings that you describe in one place in your book, uh, that, that separation is built into the game the cosmic game, as, as Stan Groff would call it. And that what I'm understanding you to say is that identity is reconstituted in a, in a rebirth process because of the very nature of the, of the universe and consciousness, that consciousness separates so as to play again. Am I, am, am I understanding you correctly? Yeah. <clears throat> I think your description of uh, ego death is spot on. Uh, what dies is what is consumed is our self-representation, what we have, our sense of identity that we've amassed from our physical experience and our time-space existence, our time-space experience. And I also want to mention that every, every medicine has a certain range. It has a certain, you know, signature, and it has a sort of power and a range. Psilocybin, has a certain depth of range that even if you repeat it 
many times it will reach you, take you into the upper register, but still there is an upper register. Ayahuasca has a range and maybe I think of it as a deeper upper register. Uh, Salvia divinorum has a range, um, ketamine and, and 5-MeO DMT. All of these substances have ranges. Now, one of the things and LSD has a range. And of course, then we start looking at doses and how doses affect the range. Now, I tend to experience psilocybin as a very body grounded uh, type of psychedelic experience, very much tuned to my emotional body. Uh, it opens up a range, but it's, it, it, it stays in a sense within the parameters, it stretches, but does not shatter as aggressively as LSD does the parameters of individual identity, but it can dissolve them, soften them and open us up. In my experience in working with high doses of LSD is that all of these things happen, but because of the particular intensity of this substance, um, and its lack of history anthropologically. It's, therefore, it doesn't have the feels associated with it that psilocybin or mescaline or peyote have uh, associated with it. It tends to shatter our time-space identity and throw us in a level of experience that lies beyond that reality, in a spiritual reality. But if we if we uh, go back to that place again and again, our experience there begins to congeal and we develop a, an alternative identity persona. I call it the shamanic persona. It is an identity which is comprised of all of my experiences at that level of transpersonal reality. Uh, and it's kind of superordinate to my individual egoic identity. But it's stable. If my experiences have been well managed, it's stable. So that when I go into a psychedelic space and I transition away from time and space and I, I enter into a familiar sense of self at a certain level of spiritual reality. But if... And I, I, I acclimate there. I, I learn how to stay conscious there. I, I learn the ropes and then I, but if I keep pushing the edge, if, I, if, the, if the chemical is strong enough and if the intent is focused enough, eventually, in my experience, you come to the ceiling and at that ceiling, there is a, a, a cost that's exacted. Uh, another round of death takes place. But what's dying is not the ego. What's dying is that shamanic persona or that second identity, because that second identity is a holder of a certain level of transpersonal experience. And if you want to go deeper, you don't need to. But if you want to go deeper, you've got to die at that lower shamanic level. And so the shamanic identity dies and you transition into yet another level of reality in which the whole workings of the universe is different, and different rules, uh, different phenomena exist, different bandwidths, so to speak. And you must acclimate to that level of reality. Every step deeper into the universe is a step into a higher level of energy. I can over and, and you and to acclimate at a particular level of reality, you must acclimate to the energy. And that's some of the, the very, very intense cleansing that continues to take place 30, 40, 50 sessions in is because you're 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 learning how to stabilize consciousness is extremely high levels of energy. Uh, and, and that just takes a long time. So, so what eventually came out of all of this is, is an understanding that death and rebirth is stage specific. 
that there are many levels of the universe. And if you systematically push through those levels, there are uh, gates that you come to, so to speak. And at each gate, there is a sacrifice asked. Now, at the end, eventually, once you've died so many times, death becomes a meaningless concept because you always learn that you're always going to be reborn. Some essence of our identity will continue. The phoenix always rises. Eventually, the concept or the, the, the concept of death as an interpretation of what's happening yielded to a concept of purification. I learned that all dying is in fact purification. It's just that when purification reaches so deep, it's destructuring whatever self-representation or whatever reality representation you're operating within, it becomes purification unto death. It's actually dissolving the structures within which you are holding reality. And death, so it's, it's death, but it's a fluid death. It's a purification process. So, so Chris, following up what Roger asked you know, about what dies, well, what doesn't die? Yeah. <laughs> ah. Because in your book, you talk a lot about reincarnation as been, being a given yeah. in, in the universe as it was revealed to you, this universe, yeah. multiverse, whatever this yeah. mysterium tremendum is yeah. that, that you've brought back to us to talk about. So what doesn't die? Well, I think when we go deep, we realize that everything is dying constantly. Everything is dying and living and dying and living constantly. There, there are no stable things which are not dying in this universe. And uh, to see that clearly, of, is, of course, is, is considered a great accomplishment to really understand that everything is temporary, everything is transition, everything is moving Everything is fluid, holding on. You know, people have asked me, what is it that dies? And, you know, there is, what I will say is there is, there is always continuity of memory. If you do your, if you organize your session well, there is continuity of recall. So therefore there is continuity of memory. You might say that memory doesn't die, but I don't really think that's the best way to describe it. I think memory is shattered and reconstitutes into it. I don't know of I don't know what doesn't die, but here's here's well, something is being purified, right? What is that? What is that that's being purified? Yeah. Well, I'd go farther and say, um, I think that in this process that life gives birth to individuality. Not an ego, not a self, but life is giving birth to an individuality. And the nature of that individuality matures and deepens as the soul matures and deepens and as one's spiritual experiences deepen. Uh, my understanding, I mean, the Vedantic traditions and many spiritual traditions basically believe that the individual is an illusion and the goal is to shatter the illusion and to dissolve irretrievably into uh, the oneness of all existence. I understand that cosmology, but I think it's a mistake and it doesn't jive with my experience. Yeah. In my experience, the universe is, is very intensely interested in birthing an individuality and in aging that individuality and refining that individuality and maturing it so that in the end we die, but we die in order to grow up and we die again in order to grow up. In the end, this is what I call um, the birth of the diamond soul, that reincarnation basically is aging us stage by stage, level by level, helping us grow and to become more than we were, more than we were. But sooner or later, we reach a point where all of our former lives and all of the history, all the experiences and wisdom and mistakes we've made, all of it comes together into an integrated singularity. 
And as I've experienced that singularity, when I experienced that happen in my sessions, there was an absolute, I was catapulted into a state of awareness beyond anything I had experienced up to that point in time. I was an individual, but I was an individual in pure shunyata, emptiness condition, transparent, open to all existence. I was individual, but it, within a boundless existence, but I had my full memory intact and I think that this is where the universe or the divine is taking all human beings, that individuality is not the problem. Separation is the problem. Ego, boundedness is the problem. Individuality is not the problem. Individuality is the great beauty. Yeah. It's one of the great gifts that the creator is giving us, the opportunity to be an individual. Chris, can you draw a distinction there between the individual, individuality and separation? Let me see if I'm understanding. Individuality gives a sense of the recognition of, of I can't come up with another word than ind being an individual. Yeah. <laughs> but separation usually is, but, but the individual can be, there can be a sense of individuality within the recognition of one's innate uh, connection with dependence on an ultimate unity with the all or the pure consciousness. Is that how you would distinguish from separation where there is a forgetting of the connection to the greater whole? Yeah. Uh, I think when Buddhism teaches uh, shunyata and when it teaches anatta, no self, they are not, they're basically defining a type of self experience where the, we experience ourselves cut off from other selves. We experience ourselves as cut off in a way from the universe itself. When that self dies, one experiences an individuality which is porous to others, and that is we live in compassion. And we experience an individuality which is in communion with surrounding layers and layers of consciousness so that there is a spiritual openness and, a, and a, an openness of compassion to other beings. We are still an individual, but we are an individual that's situated within the boundaryless condition. Mm -hmm. And so... And it sounds as though, it may take me a little moment to unravel this, but it sounds as though you're saying there's a value in that individuality. And I'm reminded of Ramakrishna, the great Indian mystic who was just extraordinarily fluid in his ability to roam through different realizations and states. Mm -hmm. And he described being lost in unity, but but then longing for separation so that he could worship and relate to the mother. <laughs> so there were both sides there and I hear something similar here. Uh, there are some traditions you pointed to Advaita Vedanta, for example, where the, where the self is regarded as an illusion, the fundamental reality is our inseparability or is rather the non-duality of re existence. And yet it sounds like you're pointing to out of your own, and here's the beauty of it. It came out of your own experience. Mm -hmm. You were aware of all these traditions, these ontologies, cosmologies, metaphysics, and yet out of your own experience, you, it feels like you came to the sense that there is a beauty and perfection in the individuality in and of itself. Is that correct? It is. Uh, it is, and, and let me frame it this way. Uh, before, the before time and space existed, before the physical universe existed, when everything was in the pure fertile void condition, uh, when whatever you want to call the absolute made a choice to manifest physical existence, the physical universe is the only thing strong enough, I think, to shatter the, the oneness of the absolute into pieces 
that then can become individually awakened to what it is within the body of the divine. So the, the great gift of the physical universe or one of the great gifts of the physical universe is literally the density that causes the oneness of the divine to shatter into pieces so that those pieces can become operational as divine within the body of the divine. And in that context, individuality, I think, is one of the great gifts yeah. of creation. It's one of the great gifts of, of the universe. And I don't think the creator wants to destroy that individuality after billions and billions of years of getting us to this point. Finally, when we wake up and become conscious and we can drop our conscious down to source and understand and identify that part of us, which is universal, which is oneness with all the universal, with what is alive. I don't think the intention is then to simply say, okay, let's destroy that. I think we're growing. And I think it, we're going to be growing for billions and billions and billions of years more. We are just getting started in this process of waking up to the, to the vast expanse of existence and yet we're waking up in a way in which we become lovers of it we become servants of it we become a fractal embodiment of it all these different metaphors for describing this mystery of the dance let, let me just say that, that uh, i've seen the same thing and you expressed it much more eloquently and and i feel like i'm a yellow belt you know i'm talking to a 10th don or something like that but uh yeah that somehow in in the all the preciousness of the individual that is that infinitely more precious at the same time it's a yes and it's this and that and it's working itself out and uh uh that's come through very clearly for me at times and I had to rethink a lot of my ideas about psychology, given that, and uh, feels deeply human at a good, at a deep level. And also, let me say what you were, what you were describing is your experience that at some point, the self awakens, okay, dink, that just opens. That's just, uh, Jesus said, a man must be born again. Well, what happens when you're born? You're just a little helpless infant. You're not good for anything but up being precious. And uh, uh, that's the beginning of the journey. And then it seems that you're talking about a Christ-like or a bodhisattva responsibility. At a certain point, we have to take on the responsibility, not just for our own awakening, our own mistakes, our own suffering, but for, for the all, for the collective. And that adds... Uh, I guess the word is a nobility to the task that otherwise would just be very narcissistic, if you will, and just very, you know, chasing your tail. But, but that, that understanding, that quality that you express at a, at a deep, deep level is, um, I think is essential. And because we have the archetype of, of Jesus, of, of a human being, boom, an individual who was crucified and, and murdered in this most horrible way, almost imaginable, who then goes down into the underworld and blah, blah, but comes back. Uh, still him, barely recognizable. Some of his disciples didn't, but at some level, a transformed level that uh, has kept the rest of us running in his you know, his path for a couple of thousand years. It's, but that's a story of the individual that's contained within our Western, uh, our Western treasure chest of, of, of wisdom stories. Yeah. Yeah. It is a story of divine incarnation come to fruition. And I think that story has archetypal ramifications that are much larger than the Christology that was developed to, under, to interpret it which ended up making Jesus into a unique being when really he's a prototype. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Nice. Beautiful. Nice. Yeah. And that, that seems to be a major division that occurs in each of the great religions and probably other, many others as well. Uh, and perhaps reflecting different 
different developmental, psychological developmental st stages on the people who make the interpretation. The, the, the founder is either elevated to unique status, which the rest of us can only approximate at best, or is recognized as an exemplar and as you called a prototype of the capacities and potentials latent within us. Seems a very important distinction you point to there. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I wanna mention that, um, as you said, John, when you begin to experientially tap into that in us, which is universal, then eventually all aspects of your life heaves to, to come in alignment with that. And that's why love is, is you know, deep, you know, not eros, but agape love and compassion, social justice, fairness um, naturally arises as one's spiritual practice deepens because you have discovered this hybrid nature within yourself. You are individually awake and awake to a universal bond, a universal you know, level of reality that becomes uh, an expression simply of your true nature. Uh, it's just spontaneous. And I also want to mention that um, I, I don't think you have, you certainly don't have to go where I went in order to spiritually awaken, even if you wanted to use psychedelics or spiritual awakening. To me, there's three uses that I'd separate, using of psychedelics for healing, mm -hmm. using of psychedelics to spiritually awakening. And then a third, which is what my journey became, a cosmological exploration. If I wanted to use psychedelics for simply spiritual awakening, I would recommend a protocol working with very low doses because it's about dissolving the ego and you got to get after where the ego lives in the world and that's closer to time space realities. You do not need to shatter time to become spiritually awakened. You don't need to enter archetypal reality. You don't need to go back to the beginning of the universe to become genuinely enthusiastically spiritually awakened. What I started kind of aiming at spiritual awakening, but the, the method was so powerful, it, it shoved me in a way past that or through that into a deeper, into a different agenda. And I'm entirely sympathetic to spiritual teachers who would say, you know, your time would be better spent cultivating an abiding, the abiding presence of, of the transparent condition, then learning these, going on this quest to learn how the universe is put together in these different levels. And I understand that critique and, and I, I share it to a degree myself. I wonder sometimes whether I would have, my time would have been better spent focusing more on the enlightenment side of the things than the cosmic exploration side. But what happened in my work is that it pushed deeper into the cosmological exploration side. Well, you said you were a philosopher yeah, and you went with the a philosopher's quest into this journey and uh, exactly what you said. And it's exactly what you did. So uh, there's, there's no flip-flopping there. And you did it with a very specific uh, aspiration and intention, Chris. Uh, I recall that you said before each session, you would effect you would effectively offer yourself as an instrument for the highest good of all. Very similar to the Bodhisattva aspiration, or even reminded me of Jesus' statement, "Not my will, but thine." It really felt like a an offer, a, 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 an unrestricted offering of yourself as an instrument for. Uh, for acquiring whatever wisdom you could f was opened to you or you were gifted or graced with in order to be an instrument of transmission to others. And it, it feels like your, your prayer was answered very clearly. Um, and you talked about, well, you know, it could have been as valuable to 
to just do spiritual practice and perhaps perhaps that's true but and it's kind of like let a thousand spiritual flowers bloom you ca- you gave us a new kind of flower and we are benefiting from it <laughs> and who knows how many people other other people will benefit from it so wonderful that you did what you did and beautiful that you did it with that aspiration and prayer it feels like your prayer Thank was you. answered yeah uh, Chris, how do you, what do you do these days? I mean, to keep yourself, uh, man, you went on the journey and, uh, like, uh, you know, just remarkable. Uh, and you came back and you mentioned yeah. uh, that you're teaching. Do you have a way of s- staying awake to everything that you were gifted, everything that you were shown, or do you find in the transmission and the teaching that that's what keeps you still Chris base in this limited reality, but at the same time um, in touch with and transmitting uh, what you learned on the other side, if you will. You know, there's a question I ask in the book, what is the value of true but temporary knowledge? And I don't doubt that any of the experience that I had on my journeys was true. And I also know it was temporary. And uh, it, I, I, I cannot live in those places, that, the places where I've been. I can't, the idea of bringing them back and integrating them as a stable state is, is that it may be true for certain levels of experience, but some of the deeper experiences are not possible. Uh, at least not in not in my present level of psycho spiritual development. I, mean, I know that there are great beings who can who are masters of these domains, and always they are the they are my guiding light. But I know that Chris's abilities are not cannot stabilize these states of consciousness in my present life. I use those experiences in order to. Um, I use them in my meditation practice. I use them in my Vajrayana practice. Um, they are they are the Samaya Sattva that opens me to the Janana Sattva. So they are the being of practice that opens me to the being of reality of these things. But I also have a certain... A lot of my time these days is spent grounding, just being grounded, staying grounded, living in touch with the earth. Uh, Because I spent so many years out in the far reaches of the cosmos that it's good to be in touch with the earth and grounding on the earth. But most of all, uh, I'm a teacher. I mean, I, I just, I love to find things and to share them. And during all the years when I was doing this work, I could not really share them. I really could not share them directly in my classes. Now, the first time I shared them was in Dark Night, Early Dawn, where I addressed experiences that had come up in the first half of my journey, up to about the halfway point. Uh, In LSD in the Mind of the Universe, or what I prefer to call it, the name that it had for me in all the years I wrote it, uh, Diamonds from Heaven, that's, I shared the whole extent of the journey. But to me, the most important part of it all is the chapter on the birth of the future human and the final vision. What was, because the work was so little focused on me and so much focused on the human family. It se- it just became natural that, and I guess this is by some larger cosmic design, the story that kept being pounded into me and I kept it kept being shown over and over again was the human story where humanity is in its evolution, what we are coming to, the pivot point that we are coming in, into in history, the absolute shift which is taking place at an archetypal level, at, at really at the plate tectonics of the, of the collective psyche, that we are coming to a tipping point where 
a tipping point that will change the condition of the human psyche at the collective level, not just an aggregate in number of individuals, but there is a shift taking place underneath us at the collective psychic level that is going to mark a, a, a before and after in human history. This was shown me again and again. And then years later, I was taken, I was dissolved into the human species. I mean, I just dissolved without remainder and then was taken into the death and rebirth of humanity. Not in any details, not given details of when exactly when, where or how, but that humanity was going to go through an epic, an era when it would completely lose control. All the assumed, all the assumptions of life were going to be stripped away. We were going to go through a crushing ordeal as a species, an ordeal that would be so terrible for time, we would think that this is the end. We're going extinct as a species on this planet. But in my visionary experience, we come through this, we survive, and we are absolutely changed in the process. Uh, when we come through this crisis, this long crisis, we have reached, we reach, have reached something inside ourselves. We have cracked open our heart. We have cracked open our mind. The, the humanity that emerges from the historical period is a changed humanity. It is a deeper humanity. It is a more open and a more mature humanity. One of the ways putting together different things from my sessions I've come to believe that this crisis that we're coming through with a global systems crisis driven by a series of ecological crises, just tremendous converging forces that we are increasingly aware of these days. But this is a crisis of consciousness. We literally cannot afford to try to run this planet any longer as a, as from the egoic level of consciousness. The, the ego is separated and it leads to a divided world. And I think what's happening is we're, the soul is coming forward in history. I mentioned the diamond soul. I think we are literally growing up into our full soul being. And that we are coming to a point where when we incarnate, we will never be tempted to identify just with this body, but we will know ourselves to be a 100,000 year old being. And we will know that the planet that we are leaving is the planet that we will return to. We know we have these deep karmic connections with everyone around us. And we know that we are all embedded in the oneness of the divine consciousness. This is the magnitude of the, of the transition that we are going through. And I think that all of us in all of our spiritual practices are contributing to this transition. And I think it's why so many people are having such very, very intense yogic practices and, and meditational practices and past life therapy practices, because there's this is tremendous unloading, which is taking place, which is part of a collective healing, which is making way for this awakening of something new in history. Chris, you gave a beautiful description of one of the more, well, there's so many profound openings and insights you had, but you did have a profound recognition of the possible future ahead of us as a human species, which you just summarized briefly. And, and your insights are resonant with the sense that seems to be growing among many people that we are coming to a time of extraordinary crisis and opportunity. I think of that combination being very well expressed, perhaps best expressed by a mutual friend of ours, Dwayne Elgin, whose many books on, on the transition we as a, as a species are facing really point to our current time as a bottleneck in which there is, we really may face a, if not civilizational collapse at worst than a loss of a lot of our uh, our current uh, capacities as a species and the death of many, many people. Yet also he points to the possibility of this being 
uh, could be if we bring enough awareness, uh, aspiration, pure heartedness to the process, it could be a kind of collective rebirth. I'd love to hear you speak more about how the vision that seems to be emerging among a number of people with de this deep concern about our future meshes with your the insights you were given. Yeah. Yeah, Nguyen is a, is a real brother in all of this, and I've been deeply and shaped or informed as I've digested my own experiences by his methodical combing through all the ecological data and the social data, looking at our the converging forces in history through several of his books. Uh, I... I can only speak or I should only speak out of my visionary experience because I have, I have a certain familiarity secondhand through people, authors like Duane and, and other writers of our time in history. But my sense of this is really informed primarily by my visionary experience. And so let me stay just there. Um, and again, I had, this took place for me, these visions took place going back to 1990 through 1995, 96. So I was very ecologically uninformed 25 years ago when these took place. I was not aware of the, what was happening culturally and historically. As I have, when I first had the experience of the death and rebirth of humanity, it took me about a year to recover from that experience. And I felt like I was, as I say in the book, I felt like I was walking around Hiroshima a week before the bomb was to be dropped, knowing what was coming with profound compassion and deep respect for all human beings on the planet knowing that they had all volunteered to participate in this grand exercise and at a deep soul level that they knew what was coming, even though at an egoic level, they may be, did not know what was coming. It took me a year and a lot of work to stabilize. And ever since that time through the early nineties, I've held this, this knowing in my body. I mean, it literally lives in my body what's happening. And then as, as I become more informed by the historians and by the, the ecologist and the environmentalist, and we really begin to see, I get a better hand, a grip on global climate change and whatnot, it meshes, it seems to mesh very well with what the inner experience is. With the variance that there are some people who are serious students of the data who believe that we're not gonna make it. The data is just so strong that we've already had our shot. And even though we're, we're living on borrowed time and we will not make it through this transition, we are essentially extinct already. And all I can say is that in my experience, that's not what happens. And, and it's, it's not because the crunch that's coming is not as bad as we think it's going to be. It's going to bring us to our collective knees. It's going to be worse than we are now even envisioning. It's going to, to just break us down completely. That's a very painful and probably very realistic vision it sounds like and at least from what i understand of the data and yeah. and we, we come through we come through we come we through come, we don't come through but a new we is born i believe that these historical pressures that are building are literally a birth they are truly giving birth and that to the future human but then the question is, well, what will this future human look like? What is actually being born in history? What do we mean? Is this just more of an, an analogy or some, what do we mean when we say it's a birth? And the way I understand this, I go back and I, I look at it through reincarnational lens. I mean, you know that I believe that reincarnation is a 
empirically demonstrated fact of life. Ian Stevenson and other scholars have just demonstrated that reincarnation is true. My first book on life cycles was about reincarnation. The, when I look at the universe, I see, uh, I see our planet pulsing in and out of time and space, uh, reincarnating beings. I see us century by century, millennia by millennia, beings reincarnating time and time again. In giving birth, labor is very, I mean, gestation is long. Labor and birth is short and intense. I think the human family has been gestating the future human for hundreds of thousands of years. We have been gestating the future in the dynamics of reincarnation. The labor that is taking place, I think, is a short, intense, convulsive period. But what we are giving birth to is already foreshadowed once we understand the dynamics of reincarnation. What is coming forward, I think, truly, is the consciousness which holds all of our reincarnational experience as a simultaneous present. This is a consciousness that we all contact if everything goes well when we die. When we're born, we're contracted into small ego. When we die, we return to the soul. When we're born, we contract into another ego. When we die, we return to the soul that holds all of our memories. Not fragmented, but integrated as a single being. If we keep this up over and over, sooner or later, the soul awakens inside human incarnation. And I think that's the being that's being born in this historical crisis. Souls will live on this planet differently than egos live mm -hmm. on this planet. Mm -hmm. I think all the great spiritual leaders of the axial age were all foreshadowing, were giving us teachings that were helping bring this about. They were all teaching us to think deep, to look deep, to feel deep, and to, to, to allow the needs of others to become superordinate to our own individual needs, but not canceling out. They were, they were inviting us to, to live old, to live wide. And I think now, just as we are trying to become one planet, ecologically, Politically, the world citizen is emerging. That is being matched by something that's taking place inside us. So as the world is trying to become one, we are trying to become one soul integrated within ourselves. And I think we're going to make it. My experience, at least, my visionary experience is while nothing is, nothing is decided, nothing is determined, predetermined, my experience is that we make it. But this is not the end of the story, of course. This is simply the next stage of human evolution. Human evolution is going to continue as long as the universe is alive. So whatever we're doing now, it will be superseded eventually by yet another stage of, in our development, in our spiritual development. But this is a particularly important stage right now. And Chris, you, you in one sentence, I think you, you elucidated a very important point, a kind of pivot point for this possible rebirth of the human species. You said, nothing is predestined, it's up to us. So that's a big statement. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I mean, if it's... If everything were predestined, there would be no point to incarnating, right? Because if everything had to be the way it's got to be, then there, we wouldn't be learning. And if we're not learning, there would be no adventure here. Mm -hmm. So it is open-ended. We could lose the planet. We could yeah. lose this opportunity. It's going to require our very, very best and our very deepest in order to come through this changed and built better. And so, it, mm -hmm. so from that perspective, then your vision may not be one of 
this is the way it's going to be, but rather here is the possibility to which we can allow, so we can open ourselves. You know, yes, and I have to acknowledge that. I think this has happened. I think there are some times when people who nearly die, part of their life review, they have a life preview. And sometimes what they, and they see of the future, which does come true. And sometimes they see a future which they can change. And I talk about this in the book, Ken Ring's work heading toward Omega. And so if they're seeing a future that they can change, they're seeing a conditional future, not an absolute pre preset future. So I think what you're saying is true, that what I'm seeing is a possible future, maybe even a probable future, but a possible future that we still have to enact. So I, I say yes to that. And I have to add a, a postscript. Some of my experiences have taken me so far into the future, into what I call deep time, not eternity, but into time, but a different modality of time, have taken me into, the, into deep time and have given me an experience of this historical transition that humanity is making, not as a future event, but as a past event, as something that we have accomplished. So from that perspective, from that deep cosmological perspective, if I were speaking from that voice, I would say, we will make this transition. Nature knows what it's doing. Nature has not brought us here unprepared. The genius of the universe that we see in DNA and galaxies, the genius that saturates every piece of the universe, knows what it's doing when it brings us when it, to this particular critical turning point. We will make it. We will become more than we have ever been before. Beautiful. <clears throat> May it be so. And, it be so. and from my own perspective, which is may, or not having had your visions agnostic about the, whether we'll make it or not, it seems like whatever perspective we hold, the only thing to do with our lives is to do what you did to offer them in the service of human well-being and, and survival. Yes. Is yes. that congruent with your? Absolutely. Well, it, it's, it's going to take all of our, our very, very best efforts to move forward and uh, to move forward deeply uh, and with a deep heart, with an open mind. Absolutely. All, all hands on deck. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Chris, I get, I get a, a feeling from you, uh, just, you know, my hit as a man who's heeded uh, the calls in his life. Uh, you went and you became educated and you got all that part squared away in your life so that later on you'd be in a position, much better position, uh, to share what you were called again to learn. And you had the courage to keep it up my God, that is a miracle in itself over those 73 journeys and that, that you're also at peace with yourself because now you're, you're giving back this vision. You did this work and the, and the work continues in the sharing of it. And uh, that's a pretty good place to be. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is a good place to be. Um, it's always a good place to be when one comes to a point in one's life where one feels that one has done what was asked to be done. Mm -hmm. And um, then the rest is gravy. And um, now I'm in the situation, writing the book, when I finished writing the book, I, I knew that I could, I could die at peace. Yeah. That, that was the closure of the project. Now I'm in a new phase where I'm trying to figure out how to make what I did useful to other people. Uh, how can I serve other people 
carrying the knowledge or the memories that I have? How can I make it useful to people? Um, and I'm still figuring that out. I, I don't, I'm still trying to figure out how I can be useful to other people who are on their own spiritual path, on their own intellectual path, who are doing things I, I can't imagine doing uh, wonderful things. How can I be useful to them to support them in their process as we enter this time in history? Beautiful. And, and it sounds like that's a, a question that's really been with you and challenging you. And I, I just want to put it in a context. It seems like there are two different kinds of questions. There are knowledge questions. Is it raining outside? Look outside. No. In the question, there are wisdom questions, which more, seem more like cons. They're questions you can ask repeatedly. Each time you do, they take you deeper into the question, deeper into yourself, deeper into life. And sounds like this is your your wisdom question, or your as sometimes called your sacred question, that is now to the forefront in your life. It is. Uh, and I know that when I have the opportunity to be with uh, like-minded spirits, like-minded beings, and we talk about these things, uh, I know that Something happens inside me that my shell is pretty thin anyway, but something happens and I get porous. And when I get porous, a larger knowing flows through me, works with me. Uh, I become irrelevant, but the teaching teaches itself in that way. And that's, that's really why I wrote um, The Living Classroom, because this was happening in my classroom. I never, ever was able, I never talked about my psychedelic work to my students. I didn't bring it into the classroom. I built a firewall between my spiritual practice and my teaching work. But I found that the deeper I went into the consciousness of the universe in my spiritual practice, the more it began to activate students in my classroom, the more there was an unconscious transmission, an activation taking place, which I had to learn how to manage and how to control, not control, but how to manage in order to keep everything safe for everybody in the classroom. Uh, so I've learned how that works. And I've learned that when you throw a stone into the lake, it naturally ripples out entirely. And so everybody, when we do steep, deep practice, naturally people around us are going to be touched and are going to be influenced. So I know that when I, when people's questions take me to reflect upon life in a way which is informed by my experiences, there is a gathering and a reinforcing that takes place between their psyches and my psyche, and together we become more. And there is a, a transmission that sometimes happens and a healing that sometimes happens that no one is in control of. And yet it seems to be the work. Now, what's happened since the book has come out, COVID has, has shut down personal uh, contact of that sort. So that I've been in a period of incubation and we're having lots of Zoom meetings. And basically I've been incubating and trying to um, see where this is going, see where it wants to go. I'm about to begin a seven week online course on the book, which will give us another opportunity to push this a little bit farther. How much can we actually give this transmission uh, online? I would rather be doing it in person, but right now it's an online world. Uh, well, from where I'm sitting, it feels like it works pretty well. So. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And Chris, what's the name of the course uh, so listeners can find it? Well, it actually hasn't been given a name yet. Um, this uh -huh. is going to be on the Shift Network. The Shift uh -huh. Network is producing it. It's going to be on LSD in the Mind of the Universe, but uh, we haven't 
settled on a name. It might, it may be called Diamonds from Heaven. It may be called a spiritual journey into the mind and heart of the universe. But it'll be on Shift Network starting the middle of November, and it starts November 30th. And Chris, do you find that people are responding, uh, such as it is, given the times that we live in? Are How's it going? Are the books selling? Are your people going, oh, my God, have you met any fellow travelers who maybe had similar um, you know, experiences and, and, and note, I mean, from, from my experiences, what you're saying really corresponds and deepens and fills out, you know, what I've learned in my own journey in my own life. So uh, how's it going? It's going just as you say, there's nothing unique about my experiences. It's just, it's in a, it's in a group of all of our collective experiences that pushes the boundaries in certain ways but I've had many people write me and say, I, you know, you've, you've clarified what my experience has been. Here's what I've experienced around this topic. And I've had many people write and say, I've never touched psychedelics in my life, but I've had many experiences that are completely in alignment with your experiences. Let me explain to you my experience. And it's, so it's clearly, this is, this is a large pattern uh, that's coming up within the, the collective psyche as a whole. Um, and, and it's been a joy. It's a joy to share and then to enter into conversation with other journeyers. What's important is not any one person's experience, clearly. What's important is the, in this case, the psychedelic experiences or the psychedelic and spiritual experiences of the entire human family. When we put all of our experiences on the table, then we can sort out which ones are uh, not essential or which ones are idiosyncratic and find the ones that are universal and are more epistemologically valuable. And to do that, we have to put all of our experiences on the table. So for me, I'm simply putting my experiences on the table in dialogue with other people as we all put our experiences on the table. And then we begin a conversation of those experiences. And I think we're still in the early stages. I mean, I think the, the book you edited, Roger, of the early psychedelic elders, you know, that work was putting it, a, a certain generation's insights on the table. And I think it's beginning again. The tricky part right now for me, and as people absorb my work is the focus of the psychedelic renaissance is psychedelic therapy. And that's exactly where it should be. Healing the human psyche, careful um, control studies, lots of brain wave maps, you know, and all that stuff. And, and very, very careful control studies. And to a certain degree, my work rocks that boat because it's, it doesn't follow that protocol. It uses extreme doses, high doses. It's using a very, very powerful chemical, which doesn't lend itself to healing as much as well as MDMA or as psilocybin. Um, and so there's a certain tension, I think, between the therapeutic focus of the present, very important work being done and, and my work. And yet there is a huge underground psychedelic community, uh, which is not weighted for a scientific validation. Yeah. And um, this community, I think, has been having a conversation among itself for many, many years. And I think my work is being received very well uh, in that community. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. <clears throat> yes. And, and you spoke of, you know, you're still exploring the next question. Uh, you spoke of a period of some years, I think 20 years of assimilating these experiences. So, so it sounds like the process, process of integration has been very long and has had its own challenges. And perhaps that's not a topic that's given enough attention in spiritual circles. There's a lot of focus on 
doing the practices and opening to particular states of consciousness and insights, but, mm. but not so much perhaps on the very essential work of integration, which is an assimilation of the experiences, a reflection on them, a recognizing their implications, dialoguing about them in community, anything which allows us to come to a broader understanding of their implications and possibilities and to and and their implications for how best how now shall we live yes yes there is a book that's just been published called psychedelics and psychotherapy uh, that is a collection really focuses on this issue of integration i have a, an article in it uh, very important i think that we're we're getting past the stage where uh, the excitement over being able to break through to these dimensions of consciousness is kind of calming down and we're beginning to realize that the real issue is what do we do with these experiences how can we hold them how do we integrate them um how, how do we integrate them individually in small community and how do we integrate them intellectually so that we shift the paradigm of the reality that we're living within that and of course psychedelic experiences uh, support the paradigm of a living universe that the universe is not dead matter but the entire universe is alive it supports the paradigm of an intelligence orders and orders and orders of intelligence that lie behind and within physical existence so there's so many levels to it and I, and I would offer my own experiences uh, some of what not to do. I mean, I'm, I'm deadly serious when I say, I think I, I pushed myself harder than was wise. At the end, when I was this, the chapter that was the hardest chapter in the book to write was the last chapter coming off the mountain where I reflect upon the years after I stopped my sessions. It took me a year just to write that chapter. I thought I paid a lot of attention to integration throughout my work. I, I wrote all my sessions down. I, I did a lot of spiritual practice throughout. And even though I couldn't teach this stuff, I, I had it in conversation with my partner at the time. And uh, I really, I paid a lot of attention to individual integration. I wrote The Living Classroom to to reflect, tell the story of how I took care of my students who were being touched by the work. So social integration. So I thought that when I stopped these sessions, I would be able to uh, step away and I would live with the bounty of the extraordinary gifts that I had been given. And the most important of which, which emerged in the last five years of the work we haven't talked about yet, but the diamond luminosity sessions that those particular immersions into dharmakaya the clear light of absolute reality but what i found was that in the years following in five or six years following my sessions when i stopped i had entered what i called the deep sadness uh, it was a period of withdrawal into a loneliness from not being able to return to such ecstatic experiences of being dissolved into light, literally just into light. I knew that I needed to stop. I for reasons I, I, I knew it was important for me to stop. I had to spend years absorbing what I had, but there was such an unfulfilled longing to return to those dimensions of reality that I found, I reached a point where I realized I was just waiting to die. I was taking care of my children. I was taking care of my students. I was not suicidal. I was li living a balanced life. But in my heart, I was just waiting to die. And I, with more time, I realized something's wrong here. This is not the way this work is supposed to end. This is not, I made a mistake. Somewhere along the way, I made a mistake. And I began to wonder, is it possible to have too much God? 
but I knew the entire physical universe was God. I knew that the divine is everything that exists. So it's not a matter of having too much God because I knew God was, I was living inside God. So what was the mistake? And eventually I came to, to see that the mistake was not too much divine of the divine, but it was too much transcendence. There is a balancing act between transcending time and space and being embodied inside time and space. And there are truths in each of these realities. And I had plunged myself so deeply beyond time and space so many times into such intimacy with that which supports time and space that I lost my bearings. I lost my foothold inside time and space. And I had to, so I made a, a, an absolute decision to ground myself inside time and space and to let what I had experienced in these subtle states of consciousness, to let it work its way into me. I had to literally not alter my consciousness so that these states of awareness could enter into my physical being, whereas previously it had entered into my altered being. Now it had, if it was ever going to enter into my physical body, I had to sit still and let it come to me. Because as you know, in these states, nothing in reality changes. We don't do anything. We simply wake up to something that's always been there. It's always been there. And I had reached a point where I simply had to, to sort of be patient and let this transformation take place. And so in a sense, on the one hand, there's nothing more for me to do. And on another hand, yeah, there's something more to me for, for me to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you're talking now about a very interesting topic. You're talking about the traps that can go with this kind mm -hmm. of deep work. And usually we talk about traps on the spiritual path or with psychedelics as, uh, some of the, we usually talk about the earlier paths, the traps of being overwhelmed, of fear, of terror, of acting out certain psychodynamics, of ego inflation, uh, taking these experiences to be proof of our unique transpersonal nature and specialness. And yet you're pointing to some of the traps that can occur uh, significantly further along. It sounds like you're talking about, uh, about well, you, one way of framing what you just said, this deep sadness or loss is, would of course be, and you do this in your book, I think, uh, the, in terms of the dark night of the soul of St. John of the Cross, the, the challenge that comes when we taste something so transcendent, so divine, so inspiring, and then lose that contact in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. And you're talking about the, some of the traps that can come with a sheer amount of energy coursing through one's body and the, and the, uh, the possibility of transmission as a result and, and of being seduced by those capacities. Mm -hmm. so, so this is a very, this is another kind of gift you're giving us, pointing out, giving us the beginnings of a map of the more advanced traps yeah. that can come yeah. the traps that happen when everything goes right uh. <laughs> not, from, not from deficiency but when everything goes right you can have too much of a good thing i found i didn't know that at the beginning but you can well, is, have... is it too much or is it our attitude towards it i think you can have too much of a good thing in the sense that uh. i think in every one lifetime most of us we can only integrate so much and productively. And I think it's possible to bite off more than we can really thoroughly chew. And sometimes I think I bit off more than I could, more than was wise for me to chew. And, but you're all absolutely right. Uh, there are so many pitfalls on this path. Uh, ego inflation, thinking you're special because uh, you've had a special experience and it's so important to stay grounded, really grounded, 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 so that all of these things wash through you. And 
my wife was was very good at helping me remember always, always, what's important is not what happens on the day of your session. What's important is what you can do the day after your session. Mm. It's, it's that you, it is how you live your life in the world, carrying the insights that you've had as best as you can into your fallible life and recommitting yourself to purifying your life of all of its, ex, all of its, you know, messy garbage and living a clean and compassionate and proper life. And that, that continues just because you've become one with God. What happens is I don't actually these days, I don't know why anyone would want to become one with God. Because once you do that, it triggers enormous purification processes that don't stop. I mean, it's just, it goes on and on, you, you know, it just deepens. Yeah, there are lots of ways for this path to go wrong. Yeah. Uh, and yet there was something which, in the, in the way you approached this, that allowed you, uh, not, there were ways you got caught, but they weren't the gross ways, they weren't, you didn't harm others, you, you, but there were subtle ways in which you get you got caught, such as the dark night of the soul. But you always you worked your way out of it. What do you what do you attribute that to? I contribute. I attribute that to um, good company, the people I was with. Uh, my former wife, Carol, we were married for 24 years. Uh, she is the mother of all my children. Uh, she was my sitter for all my sessions. She never did a session herself. She is a very serious Vajrayana practitioner. She has since gone on to complete her three-year retreat. Uh, so she's, she's a Lama, uh, acknowledged as such, and she was a great help keeping me grounded during all these years when I was, you know, going in and out of the universe. My teaching, my children kept me grounded, teaching kept me grounded, but studying the great masters, because the more I studied the great masters, the more it, it, it showed me my own uh, imperfections. It all, it showed me what I was not by looking at their greatness. And so I never, I could never take myself, they kept me uh, honest with mm. myself as I went. Mm. My students kept me honest because, you know, I, I had to earn a living teaching at an open enrollment university. And I'm walking into a classroom filled with people, many of them who don't want to be there. And I have to kind of trick them, persuade them to be interested in some of the things that we're going to be studying here. Now, it's hard work. I was not teaching graduate students. I was teaching an open enrollment university uh, for people who are going to college for the first time. So it was just good, hard, honest work that kind of kept me focused uh, and gave my body and my mind time to absorb uh, the enormity of what came forward. But eventually, eventually, the second thing I deal with in that chapter of coming off the mountain is what I call the sickness of silence. And that's the isolation of doing psychedelics in a psychedelic phobic society where psychedelics are illegal, where you cannot, even if you can share them in small groups, you cannot share them professionally. I'm a teacher, I'm a, I'm a public person. I could not share my experiences psychedelically. I literally had to retire from my work as a philosopher of religion before I could begin my real, my deepest work as a philosopher of religion. <laughs> so, that's the irony of it. In fact, I retired a little early precisely to give me enough time to write this book, to, to do this work. And as I began to, to be honest publicly in the writing of the book, this Boy, it took me a long time. It took me, before I wrote the book, it literally took me about three years just to get myself into the psychological position 
where I was willing to let people this deep into this part of my life. And the only way I was able to do that was to truly let go and, and remind myself over and over again, these experiences were not given to me for me. They were never part of my, they were never private. They were never given to me for me. They were always given to me to share, to help the human community as a whole. So by let, taking myself out of the picture and just sharing visions without owning them in a sense or appropriating them, they were never private visions. That made it easier for me to release them and let them, let them have their impact without owning that impact myself. Oh. And, and there were so many experiences, which brings up uh, another topic, and that is, if we look across the great religious traditions, and of course other traditions as well, which haven't had such a major impact, we almost always find a worldview, an understanding that there is some final experience towards which we are working. And we get that final experience and then it's, you know, all bliss and roses. It wasn't exactly what you found. And there aren't, a, it seems like there was an endless opening for always for the possibilities that, that you open to. And there aren't, to my uh, limited knowledge, there aren't a lot of examples of that. I think the best, uh, the best in, in our own time, maybe of the teacher Hamid or Almas is the pen name he writes under. And his two most recent books, uh, Runaway Realization and The Alchemy of Transformation, he, he spent decades uh, with profound study and a, a kind of spiritual genius opening to opening to enormous number of states. And then he built up this extraordinarily sophisticated psycho-spiritual map of the progression of states and the ways of working with them. And then recently he stepped off his own map and said, no, there's no, but yeah, you, you can see a progression and there's no final goal. Every opening is merely a poor, can be, can be merely a portal to another opening. And it, and he has a statement in there, which probably only a handful of people on the planet could make. He said, yeah, I've been enlightened many times. And every time everyone, someone says, oh, that's the final experience, but I always find there's something more. <laughs> <laughs> And um, that seems your experience. It is, I think. And I think it's, it's particularly the experience when you use, uh, I mean, this is a path of temporary immersion. And the path of temporary, I mean, all of our practices are temporary, but this psychedelic path particularly is a temporary path. And that's a, the temporariness is what makes it tricky. But I, like you, I thought I was doing this path in order to get to an end state, that there would be a goal. I'd, I know when I would reach it, uh, it would solve all my issues or because people describe as becoming one with God or becoming uh, dissolving into the metacosmic void. And what I found was that uh, actually I became one with God or one with the mind of the universe many times. And there, there are many gradations or many levels of oneness with God. And there are even levels of the primal void. There are levels of void uh, in the universe. Eventually, there were many levels of homecoming, of, of homecoming and peace and reunion and just relaxing into the, the bliss of return. And when the diamond luminosity opened at 15 years into the work, when, when the diamond luminosity opened and I entered this hyper, hyper clear, just unbelievably clear level of awareness, And in 
the next four years, I only, in 26 sessions, I only touched this reality four times. Lots of purification, lots of cleansing, lots of, four times. The second time I touched it was the 50th session and I was as deep into the universe as I would ever go. I was far beyond time and space. I was dissolved completely into this ecstasy of the pure luminosity. And then my visual field pivoted 90 degrees and I saw a reality far in the distance filled with a light, an even greater light than the diamond luminosity light. And a ray of light hit me from that reality and it absolutely shattered me and took me 10 minutes to recover from it. And that's when I, that's when it sunk in, that it's an infinite progression. It, it, there isn't a matter of coming to an ending spot. You stop, you come to an ending stop when you simply can take it no longer. You can take the ecstasy no longer. You can take the cycle of death and rebirth no longer. It's an endless progression. It's an endless progression. And that's one of the reasons I would be gentler with myself if I were to do it again. I, I recommend others. It's not about reaching an end state. It's about opening up, letting all this wisdom in, letting the beauty in, letting the healing in, going through the purification process and becoming a little more alive, a little more conscious and in the dance of life, in the dance of the universe. But it's not about reaching any end state. And you, you had that recognition. There was always more and... And the always more required something of you. It required a another level of purification for e for each taste of that something more. And you just alluded to what you called the diamond il illumination, which in some ways, I mean, I hesitate to put any any differential value on these things, but in some ways felt like one of the most impactful of all experiences that you had and something which left you, as I recall, you said in the book that, that for this, you would gladly die. Um, yeah. So, it's, and you relate the, you, what you called the diamond illumination to the experiences described as the culmination point in in some other traditions, uh, just be lovely to have you expand on, on give us a feel for this realization to whatever extent you can, of course, uh, and for how it relates to the, the goals of other traditions. Well, <clears throat> as I understand it, the reality that I was taken into in those four sessions is a reality that's outside of the bardo. It is extra samsaric reality. It's uh, outside of time space and what I call the echoes of time space, bardo reality. Uh, what happened in the first two times I went into this condition, I was taken deeper and deeper into it. I had the encounter with what I call the absolute light, which showed me that it's an infinite progression. Then the next two times I went into it, this diamond luminosity began to crunch itself deeper and deeper into my physical being. I wasn't going out, it was coming in. So it literally was crunching itself into my psyche, into my body. It felt like it was changing me at a cellular level. And eventually at the very end of my journey, it, it changed my perception, it changed my, how I see things, literally, physically, how I can see things, not permanently. It gave me a temporary experience that I call diamond vision. I was seeing a hundred, a thousand times more sharply, more clearly than I would have ever seen before. And at that point, I realized that I was seeing through the eyes of the future human. I was seeing in a way that all humanity will one day see that all of our senses 
sight, touch, taste, all of our senses are being elevated and animated to higher and higher levels, the more consciousness we can internalize in our body. So this crunching into me is actually uh, an acceleration of something which is taking place more slowly for all of us in our reincarnation, evolutionary reincarnation process. And that's the message I got at the end of my sessions was that one of the reasons I had to stop my sessions was the whole movement now was no longer going out and into. The whole movement was the that which is out coming into me, coming in deeper, deeper into me. And I literally had to stop my sessions in order to let this process reach its end stage, reach its, its natural conclusion. When I reflect on the diamond luminosity condition, the parallel and I draw parallels to the spiritual traditions that I'm familiar with. The ones that stand out, of course, all the spiritual traditions speak about light. All of the reincarnational traditions speak about extra samsaric reality. The clearest description I've I've come across are in the Buddhist traditions, whose text I know the best, and their description of uh, Dharmakaya the clear light of absolute reality, the clear light, which is the, that which is the seed reality out of which all existence emerges, that which is the love out of which all emotion, all love emerges, that which is the pure distilled power out of which all energy of creation emerges in its absolute transcendent, hyper clear, clear form containing everything within it and nucleus and yet something which is beyond creation itself. Truly I understand why touching that reality even once undoes centuries of living in the shadows of karma. Karmic vision is always shadowed and it's always approximate, it's always conditioned. But to touch something which is so profoundly unconditioned, and then slowly, the task I think is to slowly shape one's life so that one can live the conditioned existence in abiding communion with that which is unconditioned, to live the light in one's physical manifestation, something I am just getting started. I have so much to learn in that process. I'll never be able to, <laughs> I'll never be able to conclude this during this one lifetime. But my belief is what the universe seems to have promised me is that when I die, I will return to that condition, that there is nothing I need to do between now and when I die to return to that condition. And if I meet any obstacles along the way, if anything arises which would prevent me from returning to that essential truth, I have learned how to dissolve those obstacles by taking any obstacles into me until eventually they dissolve of their own, of their own weight. Mm -hmm. uh, what a wonderful vision and, and something which clearly, e even as you recount it now, I could see you going into your own experience and being deeply, deeply touched by it even now, 20, 30 years later. So it, it's an exquisite example of the way in which these experiences touched and incarnated in and as you and still have their resonance and, and, and impact and transmission. I, I felt palpably touched mm. by, by the qualities of uh, qualities that 
that you're expressing out of your in your description given out of your direct experience which felt partly out of your direct experience in this moment mm -hmm. and a very exquisite transmission and you also spoke of once more of the idea that these awakenings the recognitions of these remarkable realities are not the end point that that there's a that's a stage but beyond that is the integration the bringing it allowing it to incarnate in and through us and you pointed to what you called the diamond vision and you mentioned that the the diamond illumination was most resonant for you with the Tibetan Buddhist tradition and interestingly the Tibetan Buddhist tradition speaks further of of a stage beyond that which it feels like you're illuminating of of pure perception a recognition in which one's perception is so transformed by this realization that one sees this world not as some merely mundane material reality but as an expression of that uh, diamond illumination one sees sacred beings, one sees it as what's called a pure, a pure land, optimized for awakening and expressive of awakening. Mm -hmm. uh, so they call it the pure perception. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, of course, but yeah. it might be, not, it might be interesting for our listeners to know that your description, not only of the oh, awakening to the diamond illumination, but its very effects on you, uh, something that is recognized and highly valued in certain traditions. Yeah, truly, there is nothing unique in any of my journey. In any, it's I'm simply rediscovering things which many, many people and many traditions have already discovered. That the technology may be a little bit different, but the core understanding of existence, the core truths, the core insights. Uh, have been with us for a long, long time, embodied by great beings, passed along generation by generation by great beings. There's really nothing, uh, there's nothing unique in my work. And it, you, you open to a to experiences that others have opened to and you had your own unique constellation and you bring to it something which is unique, your own uh, gifts as a philosopher and theologian. So, so it, once again, it's the <laughs> yeah. yes and. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you something that the mother told me at the end and um, when I was really not sure what to do with all of this and what the mother which for me you know the, my my naming of the absolute tends to run in the feminine direction uh i i see myself as a servant of the great mother and i see all physical existence as the embodiment of the great mother and the transcendent divine as more male and the embodied divine is more female but what the mother said was Simply let them see me as you have seen me. That's mm. all. Just let me let them see me as you have seen me. They'll know what to do with it. It will serve them in ways that you cannot anticipate. Just let them see me. And she was very clear. She said, you know, you didn't give yourself these visions. You didn't decide what visions you were given on any particular day. You were not, you did, had no control over when you were broken and when you were nourished, we did that. None of this is of your doing. It was all our doing. And you have no right to hold on to any of it. Mm. And I think this feeling is a feeling that spiritual beings or people who have given themselves over to intimacy with the universe have always felt that they, th their practice is not their own. And the fruition of their practice is not their own and they have no right to hold on to their fruition of their practice because it's in the very nature of the of the awareness that 
the divine serves all and the divine is all. And in the end, it's the mother speaking to her children. It's the mother's love for all of her children. And it's the mother's desire to wake up all of her children, which is the driving force of it all. And I was, I was struck by your description then, which echoed a theme in the book that when you were, <clears throat> when you were portraying the communications you received from very profound uh, realms of consciousness and being, that you did it as, did it in the plural, first person plural. We have given you these gifts. And I think it's reminded me very much, as you pointed out, the Quran, where Allah speaks as in as we. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't think I don't think it's a plural like a polytheism. It's a plural like just vast. I mean, just unable to wrap our minds around it so enormous that that it swallows our capacity to describe or to concretize and somehow we speaks to that more effectively than i i think sometimes no matter how profound this are if we were to take the greatest spiritual geniuses of our generation and, and truly just the great, great masters of our generation. And if we could go forward 500,000 years or however many thousand years we would imagine, the great masters of that generation will be able to see more will have deeper experiences still because there is a certain sense in which the experience of any individual is kept within, in certain sense, the capacity of the herd. They push the edge, but they're limited by the capacity of the collective psyche. But as the collective psyche evolves, it extends the limit of the individual spiritual genius. So it's, it's an ongoing, ever unfolding, ever progressive deepening of this rapport between the creative intelligence and we who are the result of that creative intelligence. Yes. And, and I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to ask a question, which is going to be, of course, impossible. We need another few sessions, but, but it has to be asked. And that is, after all these experiences, these openings, these gifts and graces, <clears throat> and ones which had very dramatic impacts on your understanding of yourself, why you were doing this, the nature of reality, uh, which exploded your understanding in not once, but many times. And that was one of the things I found in the book and even, even in our dialogue now, recognizing my own limiting presuppositions, such as, yeah, you, you know, these chemicals are good for psychotherapy and healing <laughs> on an individual <laughs> level. But no, you were forced to the recognition, kicking and screaming all the way, <laughs> I would say, <laughs> to a larger recognition that this was potentially about a healing of collective consciousness mm -hmm. and more and always more. Mm -hmm. So obviously in a in a reality in which there's always more there can be no definitive map but how would you describe to the extent you can your understanding of the of the nature of reality how would what how would you characterize or point us towards your worldview at this time I'll do my best to answer your question and to not weep as I do so. You go ahead and weep if you need to. It's okay. Uh, 
I see the universe as a magnificent, as, the, as, as pure genius, as saturated with genius and saturated with, uh, with the genius's ambition, the, the creative impulse. I see the birth of stars and the birth of galaxies and the birth of planets and the birth of species and the birth of an intelligent, a self-aware species within some of the planets and a reincarnating species within this planet, all as acts of profound genius, of just unspeakable genius and, and love because it is the sharing of existence. It is the the gestating of the conditions that make infinite progression possible. I see death and rebirth. I see reincarnation. I see the bardo. I, I see this vision that when we die, we don't simply wink into this. We go into a very specific gra gra gradated series of levels of existence that reflect our limits and our capacities. I used to think of the Bardo as kind of the, op the, the, um, the, um, the enemy or the opposition. It was a cloud getting in the way, but now I'm begin I see it as the, a compassionate blanket. It keeps us safe as we enter into deeper and deeper communion with the true power. I will call it the divine I, I don't like to call it the divine, though I use this language sometimes, but because our concepts of the divine and of God are so childlike, are so childish compared to the reality itself. But to become, to touch that power until we are fully formed and, and capable of withstanding the intensity of that reunion, it would shatter us. It would just absolutely shatter us. We have to be very, very strong and very congealed as an individual before we can touch that reality and stay conscious and coherent within the real that reality. And that's just the level of reality outside the bardo of this particular piece of time and space. So, I don't know what lies beyond the Dharmakaya. I don't know what lies in the absolute dimension, but everywhere that I have journeyed and everywhere I have seen, there is genius arising. There is purposeful intent, uh, not, a, not an easy to recognize purposeful intent sometimes, a very, very hard, complex, subtle, purposeful intent, but it's there behind everything. It's there. It's always there. It's always pressing for more and uplifting us all. And in saying what I've been saying, you know, I'm just echoing, echoing the teachings of the great spiritual lineages of the great teachings. There's nothing original in what I'm saying. I'm simply echoing, not what I've been taught, but I'm echoing teachings that I have seen elsewhere, that it's all alive, it's all. And the depth of love that holds existence is proportionate to the depth of the genius that has orchestrated existence. That was one of the hard things for me to take in, that the genius I could see, but the love that's proportionate to that genius. I've become much more bhakti in this process than I had than I had ever thought that I would be. It's just, it's just. And patient patient wake up now wake up in a hundred thousand years wake up in a million years it doesn't really make that much difference to the creator because it doesn't think in the short term she thinks in the long term she thinks in the long term and she doesn't think about individuals she thinks about all of us she thinks about the entire planet the entire galaxy 
the magnitude of As far as I've gotten in all of this work, I've just touched the edges, just touched the edges. Thank you so much, Chris. Again, that was a, a true transmission of the, not only the magnitude and the genius, but of the, the heart, like words fail, heart chattering, heart, boundlessness of love that you saw and what is what is inspiring is that is that yes you you keep saying in in true humility that there's nothing new in what you saw but the fact that you did see it that you are reporting your own experience that this is direct phenomenology not some out of some textbook, but this is what you found in your direct experience. And it echoes the discoveries of the great saints and sages throughout human history. And it also echoes the findings of other deep explorers, which, uh, which uh, Stan Groff put together in his book, The Cosmic Game, where he took the deepest insights of the thousand people he'd worked with and welded them into a synthesis, a, a cosmology, an ontology, a metaphysics, which was remarkably similar to some of the findings of the great traditions, and I think was most most congruent of all with uh, Kashmir Shaivism, the very profound mysticism of India. Yeah. So, uh, yes, <laughs> from one perspective, we can say, yeah, you just saw what's been reported umpteen times. No big deal. Why'd you waste your time writing a book? On the other hand, thank you, Chris. This is a new way. The, the fact that we have, a, we have a, an integrated report of these truly uh, trans-egoic, trans-personal, trans-everything openings from a different modality is very affirming of perennial wisdom and perennial insights. Mm -hmm. So nothing is left out. You, you include the all somehow. And, and I was thinking, it's like, this guy's telling me about the burning bush and I smell the smoke, you know? <laughs> so uh, beautiful and, and holding on to your humility and your, your, your humanity and coming back and being a human being you know, it's such a gift, brother. Thank you so much. Uh, indeed, indeed. There's, there's one more theme I want to point out, bring back, or actually just point out that's been underlying so much of what you've, you've said. You've talked about being guided, being taken into, being offered, being graced, by an intelligence and love far beyond uh, that passes all understanding. And, and what I take from that is something that resonates deeply from my own much more mundane explorations and from reading uh, great psychologists and therapists and other psychedelic explorers. And that is we live usually, the vast majority of humankind lives at war with their own, their own minds, deeply distrusting of their own psyches and themselves. And yet the deeper we go, the more we discover what you discovered, that we can trust ourselves, that given when we open, open as fully as we can, we find that our minds are not these malevolent cesspools of pain and trauma and, and malevolence. Yes, there are those, some of those elements and bits we have to, have to be willing to face, but there's so much more. And that at, uh, when treated well, <laughs> when treated well, our minds are self-healing, self-actualizing, self-correcting, self-transcending. Yeah. And that's, and that leads to this profound trust, both in ourselves and in the greater reality. 
Yes, absolutely. You say it very well. Self-correcting, self-healing. We all have knots. We're all born with knots. We bring in garbage from a previous lifetime, lots of previous lifetimes. But when we bring our awareness, when we bring those knots into awareness, they open, they untie themselves. When we bring our pain into awareness, it heals itself. It's self, it's self, it clarifies. And then as, as those shadows lighter, as lighten, as we get clearer and clearer and relax them, then the genius of our being shows itself more easily, more strongly. And then the wonderful discovery is that there is no membrane, ultimately, no absolute membrane between our individual existence and the existence of the universe itself that we just drop right through. And so the awareness that bubbles up inside our individual life and the awareness which is bubbling up around life around us in totality and in my neighbors and in each other and in the planet it's the same life. It's not a separate life. So, our, and that's when, you know, I think when we begin to really understand existence, then we can relate to the beauty of the universe and own it as a reflection of our beauty. Because if we don't understand reincarnation and, and, and we don't understand how life works, we're always going to be estranged from the magnificence of a beautiful sunrise and sunset or the stars at night. But as we get clearer, everything begins to become simpler, uh, more transparent. And that's just as you say, we're self-healing, self-clarifying, self-arising. Mm. Wow, uh, Chris, you have given us such an incredible gift, and I I know that you are very aware that this is not your gift, <laughs> and that you you are the instrument through which this gift has come, and that's the aspiration with which you entered this very intense, decades long investigation, uh, and yet. Or well, because of that, this is an extraordinary transmission you're offering. Unique, yes, yes, re perennial discoveries, and yet unique in its own form and time, and the capacity for contextualizing within the best of our contemporary knowledge and understanding of the great tradition. So it's a priceless, just a priceless gift, and I think John bowed to you before I bowed to you. We both, both bow, and well, and you, you'll let the bow go through you, <laughs> gentlemen. I know enough of each of your work to know who I'm with here, and I bow to you deeply because uh, I know that all of, all three of us have been working these fields for a long time. All three of us have been nurtured by the wisdom and have been contributing to the wisdom. So I. The bow is returned, brothers. Truly, truly is. Uh, thank you. And that's the way it is in, in the tr spiritual traditions. They, one bows, we bow to each other, recognizing who, who we really are. Uh, Chris, is there anything you'd like to say that by way of completion? First, I'd like to say thank you. Uh, I become more whole, I become healed and more whole when I get to speak about these things. Then I get to do what I was designed to do. And there are still not that many places where I get to have the conversation that you pulled for me today, that we had together today. So I want to say thank you. And I'd like to add as a, a footnote, if there were one gift that I wish I could give people straight out of my experiences here. It would be the gift of letting go of the fear of death. Just letting go of the fear of death. If you're afraid of death, you have life turned upside down. 
this is where the hard work is done. This is where we do the really hard work. Death is, we have so many stupid ideas about what happens to us when we die. Death is the great liberation. Death is even the partial liberation is a great liberation. Death is joy. Death is return. Death is to return again to the arms of the beloved. Uh, to be born is the beginning of the hard cycle. To die is the end of the hard cycle, the beginning of the easy part of the cycle. That's, that's a wonderful flip on our conventional understanding. Is, yeah. Chris, uh, you, uh, well, I'm just going to repeat myself. What yeah. a gift, but <laughs> I, want to, I want to close by mentioning again your books. Uh, there are several, The Dark Night, Early Dawn, a subtitle, Steps to a Deep Ecology of Mind. You wrote about your teaching experience and how to how teaching can be a transmission in the book, The Living Classroom. And most recently, the, and the book we've been primarily focusing on today is the extraordinary book, LSD and the Mind of the Universe. LSD and the Mind of the Universe and both John and I, uh, I don't think we can recommend it highly enough. Uh, We've both been inspired by it. Chris, it's been a sheer delight to be able to do this dialogue and these explorations with you. Thank you so much for on uh, our behalf and also on behalf of all our listeners and all the people who, who you're touching in so many ways. Deep gratitude. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you, Gilles. This has been Deep Transformation, Self-Society Spirit, talking with Chris Beish.